Cześć wszystkim. Co tam? Wzem przywiet. Sto przyskodzić. Hello everyone. What's up? I decided to make a video about a game that I have played since its release, and that game is Heroes of Might and Magic 3. As a kid growing up in the 90s, I clearly remember being introduced to strategy game with knights and warriors on the cover. Back then, you bought the physical game on a CD-ROM and installed it on your computer. When playing Heroes 3, I'm using what is called the Heroes HD Plus mod. It is great for many things, and uh, I will talk about some of those things later in this video. Though this list is somewhat meant for intermediate players, I have listed a beginner-friendly tip at the end, so if you are new to the game and would like to learn more about Heroes 3, well, this video is for you. <laughs> now I bring you 7 top tips to get better at Heroes of Might and Magic 3. Number 7. Care for your movement. In Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the movement points that each hero is given at the start of each turn during any game is decided by the unit with the lowest movement speed in your army in addition to the base speed of the respective hero. So, for instance, if you are playing as a Rampart and really want to bring Dwarves into battle to clear out a particular fight on the map, instead of being slowed down before ending your turn, transfer them over to a hero that can afford to lose some movement points. After the battle, if experiencing tremendous losses, one could of course sacrifice the Dwarves by just dismissing them all out. If you instead want to keep them for later, keeping them in your town will not affect your hero's speed when the slow units no longer are with your hero when ending a turn. Movement in Heroes of Might and Magic 3 plays such a significant role, both when moving around the map as well as in battle. Based on the circumstances, looking for a minimum loss outcome is a good idea. With this, I would like to talk about the benefits of having high speed units on your hero. Speed is everything in Heroes of Might and Magic 3. It controls which side can engage in battle first, and therefore be in control of casting the first potential spell. Clearing out those Dragonfly Hives and Griffin Conservatories will reward you with Wyverns and Angels both being high-speed units. And what I define as a high-speed unit in Heroes 3 is a unit somewhere between speed 7 and above. The point is that it has higher speed than most units, so it can be a benefit in that regard. Number 6. Know the AI. Most likely you have played against the AI at some point and you're caught off guard by getting some of your precious ranged units attacked during a siege attack. In this case, it is important to know which units the turrets prioritize to attack first. Whether you have a big stack of Grand Elves or other ranged units, you wouldn't like them to be a prioritized target for the enemy. If it so should happen that you lose your shooters while not having resurrection or animate dead for your undead units at your disposal, you would want to enter the battle knowing that there are ways of minimizing losses when engaging in a siege that has a citadel or a castle. The turrets will prioritize two main targets. The first are stacks that are small enough to be killed by the tower turrets. The second one is most likely ranged units, because their attack can be reached beyond the garrison walls. So if minimizing losses from a fight being the attacker in a siege, my experience is that the AI's tower turrets tend to go for the bottom stacks first. As the defender of a siege attack, the common strategy here 
in a long game of h3 where attacks on your bases are, well, inevitable is to recruit a hero and put it in your garrison. Well, that is if you're lucky enough to do it in time. Assuming that you have an open base, a smart and quick fix when seeing an enemy hero approaching your town would be to spread out what units that hero came with or have access to at that moment. So the point here is to spend hopefully little money for big results. So having seven units minimum in your garrison when an enemy hero decides to attack your town will give the turrets time to inflict serious pain on the attacker. A castle can dish out more damage than a citadel obviously, <laughs> with three turrets being max turrets one can have. Playing defensively this way, turrets can kill off quite a lot before an attacking hero's catapult kills off your defenses completely. Since the tower turret does extra damage, the more buildings that town has, the damage dealt in a fully built castle town will be near its max when having built the shipyard. <laughs> so make sure to find a city that can build a shipyard, you know, like the one you have in the mission campaign Long Live the Queen from Restoration of Rathia, you know. Because we are about to inflict some serious pain, yo. Seriously, four boats. That's like 4,000 gold and 40 wood. What am I gonna do with that? Anyways, thank you for that, 3DO. Thank you. A thing I would like to mention about artillery is that the artillery skill will give you control over the tower turrets during a siege attack. You know, when you're being the one that's attacked. Because there are times when the auto attack will fire at units you normally would not shoot at first. So this is a tip for dealing with uh, playing against a friend in a siege fight. Stand and wait behind the garrison. Let your opponent charge forward. If the opposite side has flyers or shooters, save your spell points to deal with them during a fight. Magic Arrow and Frostbolt are both great spells. Most mage guilds in the town has a chance of learning Magic Arrow. All heroes can learn 1 and 2 level spells without the need of wisdom. If against Deemer or Aislinn with the Meteor Shower specialty, spread your units behind the castle gates instead of clumping them together before he's out of spell points. Knowing your heroes comes in handy. You know, it can direct how much you play out your strategy. So basically, wait out till the turrets kill off the attacker's units. Problem solved. Number 5. Buy out heroes early and often. Being able to choose the hero that most likely will evolve to become your main hero at a game of Heroes of Might and Magic 3 is advantageous because there are many great star heroes to pick from. One could think that recruiting a hero at the tavern for 2500 gold is something you do once for having one scout hero at the beginning of your game, but considering how much value it is having good map awareness Having more than two is more than ideal. In fact, maxing out the amount of heroes the game allows you to have as soon as possible, having eight heroes on the map is in most cases a tactic to behold. One could think of a well-spent hero as a resource that will accumulate money over time. The game does not really stop you from buying from your tavern, so get those heroes and keep them coming too. One thing to note is the advantage of buying out heroes early, because the first two you choose from the tavern comes with a bigger army. Even from the beginning of the game, having those extra gogs and imps, you know, they're nice to have, even though it does not look good for the morale on that particular hero. I would later be preferred to go for leadership or obtain artifacts that gives good morale to even this out. 
I would like to further explain the different types of role a hero could have. You have your main, the one you prioritize leveling up and taking the necessary fights with. You could choose to go for two main heroes here, <laughs> if you're lucky to get a hero that comes with great stats, the potential of chance to learn a skill that goes well with the synergy of your playstyle. Below, the main heroes in the hierarchy as far as heroes goes, are the side heroes. They are the ones doing the job of picking up piles of resources and doing otherwise unnecessary stuff that the hero doing fights does not prioritize. Because picking up stuff like artifacts and resources requires a lot of movement points, it is best to use heroes that need more experience points to do the battles, and let the lower ones do the dirty work. Therefore, the side heroes could be great for this task. Even though a treasure chest has a chance to contain a random artifact, a good chest will give you the choice between 2000 gold and 1500 experience points. In most cases, going for gold in the early part of the game will help you establish a solid foundation. If you know that the hero class you play as has a chance to learn a great skill like earth magic. Going for the EXP option could be the way to go for you. While the game only allows 8 heroes at the same time to be out on the adventure map, there is also the possibility to have additional heroes inside of a town's garrison. Which leads me up to the type of hero that are primarily used for scouting new terrain while also going under the category of disposable. That is the scrub hero. The scrub hero can be put in situations where they must defend a siege with the intention of whittling down an opponent as much as possible with a cheap solution of units divided out on the seven possible slots while the tower turrets and a potential spellbook does the majority of lethal impact. If one has enough resources and the knowing that one could afford to lose a particular hero, or if a strong main hero was caught off guard in the chain, one could, if in the option of retreating or surrendering isn't available, to just right dismiss the hero. Even when trying to be as careful as you can, I have experienced time and time again a sudden appearance of an opponent's main hero coming out from the fog or through a one gate monolith and attacking my main hero but I'm not ready to take the fight. In addition to this, the chances that a late game hero has tier 6 or tier 7 units with more speed than most one would decide to put on a scrap hero <laughs> would be quite big at this point. Therefore, as I stated before, speed decides the outcome of what happens in battle. Even if it means having one stack of dragonflies or wyverns, it could be the savior when it means having the option to return your hero to your tavern for a hopefully feasible amount. Getting the surrendered or retreated hero back, go to your tavern and click on buy. From there, your adventures start again from hopefully a safe location because having a high speed unit on your hero will give it the advantage of the first move in a battle. I would like to further go on with the point that I just made regarding getting caught off guard by an opponent. Let's say your main hero is far from any town that you own, and a strong hero pops up charging towards you, but luckily the hero attacking is not fast enough to reach your vulnerable hero at this point. You could then attack the nearest creature dwelling and then retreat to a town that is a safe distance from danger. Yet to keep the hero, and you are given a second chance so to speak. This teleporting method can be used regardless of the example that I just provided, but most commonly it is used late game because of the amount of gold one needs to use if one has excess army that happens to be on your hero. If you cannot afford to buy them all out, but still would like to keep some by the amount of gold that you have at the moment, let some of your units die, and then take home what there is left from the battle. Number 4. Optimize your unit position in battle. 
In Heroes 3, all battles are usually played where one player is controlling the one side while the AI or another player is the one you are playing up against. Deciding to take on a dwelling like a dwarven treasury or a crypt, the setup of your units will be placed in the middle instead of on one side. Though there are battles one can take that force the player to be clumped up in a ball. Clumping up one's units is not always necessarily a bad idea. What I mean by that is that when wanting to protect a valuable unit like for instance one with a ranged attack, clumping your troops together makes it so the opponent's units will be able to reach less area when it comes to melee attacks. Especially useful is it to use this strategy when playing up against two hex units. Since they take up much space, the amount of unit stacks that will be able to surround your units are smaller. Therefore there will be less amounts of attacks inflicted when in contact overall. In this setting, with units stacked up in a clump, I want to give out some pointers on what you can do with your unit composition to be extra effective in combat. It is important to keep in mind from the moment you start the game to think of what composition of units you would want to use with this strategy for it to be effective. A prioritization would be to focus on a unit that can carry you through battles. And by that I mean being able to dish out sufficient amount of damage before the opponent is able to reach you and claw their way to the center of your clump. A thing to know about Heroes 3 is having a Ballista equipped will set it on the topper part of your side of the battlefield. The clump of units will, if you have access to the Ballista, be more effective if you put them on the top corner where the Ballista is located. The 250 health point Ballista also triggers aggro on the AI. You know, they don't like the Ballista very much. So, it can be nice to let them whack at it for some time. When having this established, protecting your valuable Grand Elves and your stacks of Battle Dwarves with the, the one stacks of Centaurs around it, it will leave room to, you know, open and close almost like a door. You could call it the Centaur door of the access to the damage dealing Battle Dwarves. It is important to move the centaurs out of the way by creating an opening for them. To be able to have the flexibility of your units to move it in and out of your clump, click the wait button. The wait button will allow you to move when all other units have completed their turn. It is a tactical advantage to have the highest speed unit set to wait. The reason for this is that as the highest speed unit in each respectable battle will move first, so when put on wait, the moment the next round begins, they have already had the option to move at the end of the first round. That way, the highest speed unit will always technically be able to move twice in a row in a battle play out this way. Number 3. Get familiar with your hotkeys. I would just like to point out that being able to reduce time doing time consuming things like manually transferring your units from one hero to another or individually creating one stacks before entering battle does make you a better player in a way that you are being effective at managing your time. Managing time is a key factor when you are playing with a time limit. With the HD Plus mod, new features are added to make transitions smoother. The necessary tools for playing the game in a way that demands less micromanagement of the player were not there in the past in the same way it is now. Let us say you buy a hero with pikemen, archers and griffins with a castle as your starting town. Now we have already talked about speed optimization, so we know that griffins are the fastest out of these three. Control plus Alt plus Shift plus Click on Griffins will leave one Griffin on the hero and transfer the rest over to the available 7 slots above the hero you transferred from. If you instead want to just transfer one stack manually, 
you can do so with Ctrl plus Alt plus click. Getting to know these hotkeys are super helpful because I know why I must learn them for the reason I just mentioned. I believe having more options in how you play any game just makes it more of a complex piece of wonder. Number 2. Do not underestimate creature dwellings. Since the main objective in most games with a 1v7 free-for-all is to eliminate everyone in order to win the game, one could say that an optimal solution to approach the game is to go and capture a town as fast as you can. While I don't want to say that this is something you should not do, in fact I suggest you to do this because having more to work with makes for a more interesting game and it will get you ahead of things. What I would like to emphasize on here is the fact that most templates hand out very good deals disguised as very hard challenges. The reason I say that they are disguised as very hard challenges is because they can be cleared out with the right tactic and they give you nice rewards like resources and units. On templates like Spider or Jeebus Cross, Dragonfly Hives and Griffin Observatories are to be found. The great thing about these kind of creature dwellings is that you need to defeat a group of monsters that will give you a great reward. The biggest challenge I see in focusing on clearing out these types of dwellings early game is having the sense of how many of your units that need to come to the fight in order for you to win the battle. In Dragonfly Hive you go up against speed 13 units. Dragonflies that cast the weakness spell with their attack? The question is then, can you afford to take those losses? Since they most likely will reach you first, considering you doing this early game with mostly low tier units. Then it comes down to how big of a hive it is versus what you can afford to lose. The reason why I want to emphasize on creature dwellings is because of the power that they potentially can have. Having one nearby your starting town can be positive knowing the goal that it provides as a one-time payment when cleared out. Because it is only possible to clear a Naga Bank once, securing that one is a very good thing. One would argue that the Dragon Utopia is the most difficult building to clear out in the game. Though that might be true, the biggest Utopia gives gold, artifacts and spell scrolls. Though Dragon Utopias can drop Tome of Earth, among other goodies, I would like to focus on, on clearing out two types of dwellings especially. Dragon Fly Hives and the Griffin Conservatories. Because these buildings give you Wyverns and Angels. If one decides to go Fortress as a starting faction, taking the Wyverns back to base and upgrading them to Wyvern Monarchs in addition to produce them in your base is a brilliant way to play because of the rate they will grow and function later on in the game. If not playing Fortress as a starting faction, getting some tier 6 units with speed 7 <laughs> can be well implemented because they come in a small number when you clear out those dragonfly halves. The bonus that an angel or an archangel for that matter has is that they give you 1 plus morale. Even if not playing as castle, clearing out a griffin conservatory can come really in handy because of the speed 12 unit with the one morale bonus. Number 1. Increase the level of difficulty to expert or impossible. Heroes 3 is fun. Having access to ghost dragons on week 1 is also fun, but is it challenging? What is considered a challenge in Heroes of Might and Magic 3? Are there rules to make the game fairer? Yes. Shadow of Death have some unbalanced things like the increased necromancy skill of all heroes you control that have the necromancy skill by 10% with the necromancy amplifier. Playing as Isra or Vidamina that has specialty in necromancy one can level up the necromancy skill to expert level and raise many skeletons from the dead. In Horn of the Abyss, the increased necromancy skill of the necromancy amplifier 
was nerfed down to 5%. Before talking about the ways to make for a challenging and fun game, I would like to go into the templates I mentioned earlier. The idea of templates are great, because it lays out a map that could be completed in a manner that forces a mindset to the player. What to focus on is different from the template to another. There are specific ways to complete them. For instance, it could be that the only way to get out from one zone to another would be to fight yourself through a large stack of monsters. So to get to the level where you could defeat them, you must play smart and understand the game as well as the template. So, cranking up the difficulty level to expert or impossible would give you less starting resources than if played on easy or normal. By knowing the templates and their characteristics, expert and impossible difficulty is not impossible to do. <laughs> no pun intended here. Even if just playing on a random map or a pre-made one, there are usually plenty of resources and artifacts around to go by from the very beginning, so no problems there. Wood, ore and gold should be easily spotted to give the player a chance to tech up or buy out desirable units. And here is our bonus tip for our beginner players. Get to know the game by playing through the tutorial. Even if you have been a Heroes 3 veteran for 21 years, or have just picked up the game and are interested, I would give this tip to anyone who would like to start playing Heroes 3. Even if you play the complete version of Heroes 3 or the Horn of the Abyss expansion, one could find the tutorial from Restoration of Arathia from the start menu. It will take you through everything you need to know in the beginning of starting to play. After finishing the tutorial, try playing a 1v1 against AI on a small map on easy difficulty. Try getting a lot of ranged units and protect them with 1 stacks. Lure the AI into your grasp and get that full damage when they are close enough with your ranged attacks. Make as much out of every day as possible, make your moves count. And with that, I wish you good luck in becoming a Heroes of Might and Magic 3 player, or just a better one yet. Dzięki za oglądanie, doceniam to. Spasibu za prosmotir, ja tsuengu jego. Thanks for watching, I appreciate it. I played using the Heroes HD Plus mod. The HD Plus mod adds many of the features that you saw in this video, like being able to see 8 hero portraits at the same time, an available quick army management, along with many other neat changes. With the Horn of the Abyss adding to an already existing game with balance changes, new factions, as well as improving on the old game that we all know and love, there is literally no tell of what a community dedicated to develop the game further is able to do in the years to come.